So the plan tonight is we will uh, have our speaker uh, who's speaking on uh, uh, the Mars rover Perseverance, which has had been in the news lately because of uh, uh, what happened with Ingenuity. Maybe he'll talk about that. Uh, and then we'll have Q&A. And then uh, we'll take a, a short break. And then we'll talk a little bit about what's coming up in the next few months. And we'll have some, uh, we have a raffle and uh, various things that we can do to also uh, inspire some conversation. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, first uh, speaker meeting of uh, 2024. Welcome. Uh, before we get started, as uh, Randy mentioned, there will be a raffle. The raffle tickets will be on sale at break. Uh, the raffles are going to go for one ticket for $2 and three for $5. And the prize is a very fantastic book by our own Betty author. Elizabeth's first solar eclipse. So good luck to all of you, and I hope you win. With that said, uh, let's, as Randy said, we will go into Q&A uh, once Dr. Hurd has uh, finished his talk. The Q&A will be before break. If you have a question as a matter of logistics, if you don't mind coming up to the mic, and asking your questions so Dr. Hurt can hear you directly. And also because we are recording this session, uh, we just want the question to be really clear. So if that's okay with all of you, if you have a question, you're more than welcome to come out to the mic and just ask your question. So that's the logistics part out of the way. With that, we warmly welcome Dr. Hurd all the way from Alberta. Dr. Chris Hurd has had the dream of studying rocks from Mars since he was a mere age of 13. After an undergraduate degree in geological science from Queen's University in Kingston, Canada, he studied meteorites from Mars for his PhD at the University of New Mexico, and then worked at the NASA Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. Since 2003, he has been a professor in the Department of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Alberta. His research includes studies of meteorites of a variety of types, as well as way of curating meteorites and future return samples under cold and clean conditions. He is a curator of the University of Alberta Meteorite Collection, the largest university-based meteorite collection in Canada and home to the world's only curation, meteorite curation facility that operates at cold temperatures. And moreover, he is a returned sample science participating scientist in the Perseverance rover mission. With that, let's welcome Dr. Hurd with a round, uh, round of applause, the search for life on Mars, NASA's Perseverance rover mission. Thanks very much for the introduction, Swapna. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you this evening. Um, um, I'm gonna to talk to you about this really phenomenal mission that I've been involved in for the past several years and uh, an overview of the mission, what we're trying to do, and, and also looking forward to um, hopefully one day having samples of the red planet brought back to earth. I'd like to start with this selfie uh, image that we we took with the, the rover after the first successful sampling of um, of this this target here, this rock that you see on the, on the lower left there, called Rochette, uh, with the two holes drilled in it. I always feel like the the rover fe is feeling uh, proud of of itself uh, at this point. So, what do we want to know about Mars? Well, Mars today is a dry desert, um, bathed in radiation, thin atmosphere. Uh, we see evidence of of geological activity having happened in the past. We see polar caps. We see, you know, clouds. Those sorts of things you can sort of make out in the left hand image. Um, but based on the geological evidence, we know that Mars wasn't always like that. We know that Mars was early in its history, uh, probably more like what you see on the right. Maybe not with a northern ocean per se, but certainly with liquid water stable on the surface, where it's certainly not. It's not stable now. Um, and this transition is one, I think, and others agree, that's one of the, the biggest questions in planetary geology 
in the, of the solar system. Why did Mars, why was Mars once sort of warmer and wetter and what happened? Another way of looking at it is this way, which we like to do, uh, where we kind of have the time along the bottom here from uh, the, the left, on the left-hand side, the, uh, the beginning of Mars's history, the beginning of the solar system, and the present day on the right in the time in billions of years. And what you can see here is it's divided up along the top into the different epochs, the Noachian, Hesperian, Amazonian. Those are the ways we divide up time on Mars. And all the action, really, most of the action is in the early history in the Noachian or pre-Noachian, it's called, to Hesperian. And in that time, we had lots of impacts, of course, uh, with de you know debris left over from the solar system, um, uh, maybe fresh influx of material from the outer solar system at, at points um, that dwindled uh, around 3.84 billion years ago. We had Martian Valley networks, which were most prevalent in the Noachian Hesperian. And then along the bottom there, you see in color coded, you see that that some have suggested that there were that the we could sort of think of the epochs in a different way, which is the, the amount of water and the acidity of the water at the surface at these different times. So in early in Mars history, and again, this is based on um, remotely sensed information about the surface of Mars, looking at the oldest terrains and seeing evidence for clays. And clays normally form under liquid water, um, alteration of, of say igneous rocks under water that's sort of neutral in its pH. And then at some point around 3.8 billion years ago, it transitioned such that the minerals that we get are mostly sulfates and those form typically under more acidic conditions. And around that time, we think that Mars is dynamo, the thing that generates, it's generated in a magnetic field um, dwindled and basically died. Um, and so we don't know why this transition happened, it, we, th but we think that in fact, things are all interlinked, interconnected somehow. And then after that point, uh, three billion years ago, beginning of the Amazonian, it was so dry, the atmosphere was so thin by that point where it had been thicker before um, that we ended up essentially rusting the surface. And that's what the anhydrous ferric oxides means. Basically it's rusting. So Mars has been, um, with the exception of some volcanic activity and wind and ice activity and occasional maybe sort of some water activity, but that would, would sort of appear and then disappear um, with no liquid water stable at the surface has been rusting for, for 3 billion years. And that's the whole reason why we can see it through a telescope. And this is actually a image that my friend Murray, um, who's a member of Edmonton, um, RAS, RASC Edmonton Center took a few years ago. Um, so there used to be liquid water on Mars. Did Mars ever have life? The one follows from the other. Uh, and, and in some ways, Mars is the closest place that we could even test whether life exists outside the Earth. So what are we going to look for? Well, the Earth's biological timeline looks something like this. The first familiar fossils show up about a half a billion years ago. Um, the time that we're talking about where Mars's climate changed was three and a half to four billion years ago. And at that time, on the Earth anyway, we had single-celled organisms um, that could that had evolved to be able to photosynthesize, to be able to to you know to convert uh, sunlight um, into energy, and um, and they have left a trace in the rock record on the Earth. On the right, we see what's known typically as a stromatolite, which are essentially layers within the rock record that go back to three and a half billion years in some cases that were probably produced by bacteria living within these layers of sediment, uh, just within tidal zones. Uh, but we're not gonna look for things like fish or or um, plants or things like that, or dinosaur bones. Although, you know, as you'll see, our rover is very capable. And if they if those are there, we'll see them. So we are gonna look for things, things, maybe things like what we see on the right, but actually more importantly, we're probably gonna look for, so we're gonna look for things that are microbial, the result of microbe, single-celled organisms, but in actual fact, we're probably gonna look for things that are more like a chemical, what we call a biosignature, a signature of life. So um, you'll see the reason why then, the, how the, the mission is put together. So we have four ambitious goals. The first is the geology because the geology underpins everything it tells us. At the landing site, it tells us what the environments were, what's recorded in that rock record. 
The second is astrobiology. It's really looking for evidence of life, um, in, on a, mostly a, primarily ancient life in these in, in this ancient environment that we're exploring. And then the third thing is caching samples, and that's a key part of this for reasons I'll come back to on the next slide. And then the fourth thing is is to there's a couple of experiments to prepare for human exploration. So why sample return? Why this third uh, uh, goal right here? Well. Rover instruments can only do so much. Rover instruments, is, on this rover, they're they're phenomenal. They're state of the art. However, we can't tell, and we won't be able to tell whether life was there in the in based on applying the best possible under the best possible conditions. We will not be able to do that with our rover, uh, with our rover instruments. Um, and in fact, you could argue that a lot of rover, even the best rover instruments today would be really hard pressed to detect my, evidence of ancient microbial life in the rocks. So the analyses on the earth are much more advanced. These are required for the detection of life or, or biomarkers. It's required for things like the age of the rock, doing things like uranium lead dating. And more importantly, as we've seen from other sample return missions, including most recently OSIRIS-REx from asteroid Bennu, um, Hayabusa and Hayabusa 2 from asteroids uh, from the uh, Japanese Space Agency. And then, of course, going back to Apollo uh, for, for lunar samples, the samples remain available, properly curated. They remain available indefinitely for future generations of researchers. And then as the technology advances, you can ask new questions and answer new questions on the samples that you collected, in some cases, decades ago. And then context is everything. We get to pick where the samples are collected. That's a point I'll come back to at the end. All right, this is our rover. It's the size of a small SUV. Um, it, it sits about just over two meters in, in height. Uh, at uh, the top of the mast, we have this pair of zoomable panoramic cameras called MassCam Z. And uh, SuperCam, which is a laser microimager, allows us to zap rocks up to uh, five meters away. And, and by using essentially a telescope along with that, with, the, with a spectrometer, a couple of spectrometers allows us to tell what the rock is made out of. Um, and then the weather station on the, on the mast here tells us information about the wind direction um, at, um, and that sort of thing. Um, we have a, a subsurface radar called RIMFAX that's able to penetrate a few meters in depth as we, drive along with about a 10 centimeter resolution so we can see what layers are are beneath us. And then on the end of the arm, we have the Sherlock and pixel spectrometers, which we use to interrogate the rocks. And this is what we use to um, tell us what rocks uh, we're driving on uh, and also what we give us information about what we're going to uh, collect um, uh, after we analyze them. Um, MOXIE is, so all of these are sort of a part of the, the first three goals I mentioned. MOXIE is part of the fourth one. MOXIE was an instrument produced, uh, provided by MIT, and it operated seven times before finishing operations last, uh, I think it was in December that they, we did the last one. And its, its whole job was to produce, to, to test whether we could produce oxygen from carbon dioxide in the Martian atmosphere. And it was able to do that successfully um, with an average rate of about six grams per hour, which is enough uh, equivalent to a small tree on Earth. Um, it would not keep an astronaut alive for very long, but it would keep an astronaut alive. So there you go. The whole idea is that you would might send something like this to Mars ahead of time before humans were to go there, and it could just take in CO2, split it, and then, and then have oxygen as a reservoir um, in advance of people going there. Uh, last thing I'll mention is that this rover is powered by a uh, what's called a multi-mission radioisotope thermoelectric generator, or MMRTG. It's in the back here where these, these fins are, um, and it basically converts heat from the natural radioactive decay of plutonium into electricity. It's a completely sealed uh, um, thing that just holds on to that uh, radioactive plutonium, and the heat from that is converted into electricity and charges are two primary batteries. It also helps keep the instruments operating at their correct temperatures. Okay, you've heard about Ingenuity. 
uh, in the news, we delivered Ingenuity a small helicopter to the surface. It was strapped to the belly of the rover and lowered down uh, a few souls into the mission. And um, here's the first se selfie that we took after we dropped Ingenuity on the surface and then drove a couple meters away. Um, Ingenuity, here you can see in the inset, is a solar-powered mission, um, solar-powered, solar-charged batteries, dual counter-rotating rotors mounted one above the other, uh, rotating about 2,400 RPM. And the whole thing weighs 1.8 kilograms and costs $80 million to, to develop. Uh, interestingly, th this was a technology demonstration to see if we could fly on another planet that has an atmosphere. And so, you know, you have a couple, it's interesting because interesting you have a couple things that are kind of going against each other here. The first is that helps you is that Mars has one third the gravity of the earth. So the amount of lift you need is less, but it also has one one hundredth the pressure of the earth's atmosphere. So you don't get as much lift. So you, so, so they, they developed this and, uh, and it's been very successful. I'll come back to that. We also have lots of other cameras on board. We have um, navigation cameras called nav cams at the top here. These are separate from mass cam Z. And then hazard cameras called has cams on the front and the back. These are all full color and um, it are used actively by the rover during for navigation. So when we tell the rover to drive, we upload commands to the rover and tell it to drive as far as possible in this direction, it will automatically avoid sand dunes and rocks and things that are a potential hazard. It'll drive around them. All right, a little bit about the timeline. The landing site was selected in November of 2018 through a community workshop. The rover had been designed and was being built and then was launched July 30th, 2020, cruised to Mars, and then over the next six months and 20 days, then landed on Mars February 18th, uh, 2021. Um, and we've been going strong ever since. It's a 471 million kilometer trip, if you're keeping track. And then uh, it came into the atmosphere and did the entire entry, descent, and landing, which is also known as the seven minutes of terror, because nobody's controlling this process. It's all done automatically using software on board. It's absolutely phenomenal that we can do this. Um, and from the point of cruising along at, at uh, um, I don't know, 10 kilometers per second or something like that, when it hits the top of the atmosphere, to deploying a chute, um, to using a, a, a system that allows what's called terrain relative navigation to be able to avoid hazardous areas, and then using a this jet pack um, and sky crane maneuver to lower the rover down onto the surface. Um, it's been done, it had been done only one time before with the Curiosity rover, which is a similar sort of uh, architecture. And uh, we were able to do it um, really successfully. And in fact, we had all kinds of video cameras and things like that. So if you if you look up the entry, descent, landing of, of Perseverance video, it's absolutely phenomenal. I just don't have time to show it today. Okay, and then uh, about three Martian days in, three sols in, we were able to stand up the mast and take our first panorama. And what you can see here is kind of cool. You can see, you know, that we're on Mars. You can see the dust effect of the jet pack, the uh, regolith or, or, or soil blasted away in certain spots around here, and also the dust on the deck of the of the rover. Um, and then you can see the uh, mountains in the distance. Those are the rim of the crater that we're sitting in. So those are the, those. These are this was the first panorama that we took. Um, since then, we just to sort of tabulate this. I was this is a slide I always update when, when I give this talk. We've taken over six hundred two thousand images from all those cameras that I mentioned. These are automatically served. Um, to the internet, to the website. We've traversed 25 kilometers and we've done the longest autonomous single day drive by any rover at 320 meters. And we've processed 26 sample tubes for return to earth. And Ingenuity has completed 72 flights and done the first ever powered flight on another planet. And it's gone over 17 kilometers, 128 minutes total flying time. All right, where are we and why? Well, we're in, on uh, this sort of uh, boundary that we see between the southern highlands of Mars and the northern lowlands. The, the colors here uh, correlate to, um, to elevation. And the Isidus Impact Basin is a major a crater basin um, that's right on this, on this boundary near Utopia Planitia. And Gisero Crater is a 45-kilometer diameter crater that's on the northwest. 
um, corner of this basin. And the most important thing about it is that there is ample evidence that water flowed into and out of this crater um, in the, on the range of three and a half to four billion years ago. And we see that from the channel that comes in, the Vivalis, and there's an outlet cha channel as well. And we also see this classic structure here that we're familiar with in geology on the earth, which is a delta. And so this is where water has flowed in to a standing body of water and the sediment carried by the river um, flowing slows down and deposits that, uh, that delta in the standing body of water. And so that's basically what we see here. And we see evidence from orbit of different minerals that tell us that are consistent with water being active in this area. So it may have looked something like this um, at some point where it was filled up with water, maybe up to 200 meters depth, um, enough so that it, it sort of overtopped and flowed out the other side. So where we ended up is right in here and shortly after landing, it was named the Octavia E. Butler landing site as per the tradition for Mars landings. Landing site is named after science fiction writers. Octavia E. Butler was an African-American um, science fiction writer from Pasadena, California, where NASA JPL is based. And uh, the, the project worked with the family shortly after landing to be able to recognize her. Uh, she passed away in, in 2006, but to recognize her works uh, in this way. So it's quite exciting as someone who read a lot of science fiction growing up and um, been excited about, about this ever since. So what we're looking at here is the floor of the crater. We ended up on the floor and this thing up at the upper left is the front of the delta. Now, prior to landing, this whole area had been mapped in, in what are called quadrangles. And the quadrangles are named after uh, Earth-based National Park or Preserve, just to keep, sort of keep track. And then for the different sort of targets and things that we investigated, the names were based on uh, names that, that fit with that particular quadrangle. So, for example, we landed in the Canyon de Chez quadrangle, which is which is in the Navajo Nation in the U.S. Southwest. And so we, um, the targets that we have in this area are all Navajo words, um, working with the Navajo Nation um, to make sure they're appropriate. And then other ones that you'll see are French because we, we proceeded down into Verdun, um, et cetera. Unfortunately, and I always do this for a Canadian audience, we unfortunately did not get any targets in the Prince Edward Island quadrangle for reasons that you'll probably see a little bit in a, in a minute. We had to kind of zip through that area um, I will point out, though, that where we are now, we are going to be in the, hopefully, we're going to be in the Gross Morn quadrangle soon. So that's a little little bit of trivia for you that not many people even know or realize. Uh, so coming up, we may have target names that are consistent with Gross Morn National Park in Newfoundland. All right. Here's where we uh, are now. You can look this up on the website. You can, this is downloaded today. Um, at the lower right here is the Octavia Butler landing site. And uh, the path of perseverance is shown with the white lines and the dots are, are waypoints basically where we spent, you know, where we spent a bit of time investigating. We quickly realized after landing that this area to the west of us, which is called Seta, which is a Navajo word that reflects the character of lots of rocks and sort of, and sand was not, we we're not gonna be able to go to drive through it. So what we did instead, and these had been mapped from orbit as different sort of possible geological units. We explored the unit that we were on and drove down around the toe of it and then went into the edge of Seta. And then we came back and went around this area, zipped through Prince Edward Island quadrangle. That's what I meant before. Um, in order to get to the front of the delta. Then we have gone up onto the delta around this Belva crater, and then it proceeded across onto the top of this, of this feature and then into what's called the margin of, of the crater. And then out where basically where it says between the A and the V of Noret Vivalis is kind of where the trace of the crater rim is. So we've gone 25 kilometers, we've done a lot of work, and then these red spots are where we have um, collected samples. Now, I will say, you'll see on here the Ingenuity flight paths as well, and I will say that this is uh, remarkable, especially since we just heard about its 
that it, it, it that it's it's finished up it's been a remarkably successful um technology demonstration the first the first flight was uh shortly after um we landed just a couple of tests we had to, in the rover had to kind of sit still to enable communication and then the third flight was on april 25th of 2021 and this is five meters altitude about 85 meters from the the rover and you can see if you look closely you can see in the very upper left you can see the rover and i'll just zoom it in um this is really cool because we could see the rover <laughs> Um, and of course, our rover could see uh, ingenuity. And what's really amazing about this is you can see the track starting from nothing at the rover landing site because of how we landed on the surface. Subsequent to that, after realizing that this was working well, now I should say it was only supposed to go three to five times and mainly just to go and to go for 30 days tops to do in that 30 days to do three to five flights. Um, up and down, up, over, down, just to test it. Well, then it, it was doing well. And so we end up, as you could, if we go back here, you can see we started to send it across SETA and send it on ahead of us, um, but also send it on uh, as, as, a reconnaissance, and as a reconnaissance type. So if you look at this little area down here in the lower right, that's SETA. And what we did was um, Ingenuity went on ahead and flew out into this very, tricky sort of area to navigate and was able to uh, essentially map a path for us to drive in. And those turned out to be really interesting, important rocks as, as I'll show you. Um, but what was it what was in the news yesterday is that Ingenuity has flown for the last time. Flight number 72 was the very last one. And what happened was um, on flight 72, uh, it was, it was, I believe it was going straight up and then coming back down again. And it was coming down and it lost communication or something happened uh, um, about a meter or so above the ground. And so it sort of had an uncontrolled landing. And the, and the groove that you see here on the left, this is from uh, the color camera that I've so showed you images of uh, after it's on the ground. So the, the foot is over here on the left. And this is probably from the foot sort of um, digging into this sand dune that we're in. But notice carefully, and this was in the press release, this ragged edge here that you see in the shadow of one of the wings is because that that material is not very strong and it it hit the ground while it was still rotating and sheared it off. In fact, you can see a piece of it down here. Um, and so unfortunately, that means it's not safe to fly anymore and 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 that's it. But considering that it was only supposed to go for um, for 30, 30 Martian days, uh, in 2021, it's gone for three, almost three years, and it's it's gone 72 times. It's really quite amazing. Okay, this is a panorama. Just to give you a sense of the geology on the crater floor. So we're seeing, of course, the usual sort of windblown um, dunes and things like that that are modern, but the bedrock itself is what we're most interested in. And of course, the, the crater rim in the distance, but also the front of the delta, which is in the lower part of this. It's this sort of middle distance sort of cliff area. We explored the, the crater floor, as I described, and we understand now that it's a series of lava flows. And this was not known. This was postulated as being one possibility, but it was not known that they were all lava flows um, until we were able to investigate. And so we see, and we what we do in geology is we sort of, we divide up the different, um, we describe the different rocks that we see, as you can see here. It's I know it's a bit wordy, but sort of, you know, um, variably massive to layered to pitted resistant cap rocks um, uh, would be one. And then we give one type of rock, sort of character of rock, and then we give it a, a member name, in this case, Rochette. And then all of these belong to what's called the Moz Formation. And the Moz Formation is essentially, had been previously mapped from orbit. It's basically the unit that we ended up on. And then Seta Formation is the one that we drove into in the sort of toe dip that I mentioned. And SETA includes these rocks that you see on the bottom. And these are these are done on purpose because, in, of course, in geology, we like to have the oldest things on the bottom and the youngest things over top. So we understand the sort of relative age of things. Um, so, so this is what we're able to do with this. And so we kind of, this was a campaign that we set up, um, but we also did sampling. And so this is the other really important component of this that I've already alluded to, that we take samples of these different units as we go along to, and the, the samples are then within context. So how do we do that? 
we have a, a sample caching system that's in the belly of the rover. And the part that does the sample collection is on the end of the arm. It's the cylinder here on the end of the arm. So when we when we go up to a, a rock that we want to sample, the first thing we do is we use what's called the abrasion bit. So there's two types of bits that we can put into the into the assembly on the end of the arm. The first is an abrasion bit and it abrades a patch that's about five centimeters across. So you can kind of just make it out in the shadow of the arm cast on this boulder here in the center of the image. There's this five centimeter diameter uh, abrasion, abraded patch, which is to get underneath any dust or weathering rind to get to the fresh surface. And then we analyze that with Sherlock and Pixel, which are these on either side of the, of the arm. Um, and, and we can tell then what the rock is made out of. And then we decide, then we take the, and we swap out the bit and we put in the, the coring bit and that's what's loaded in here. The coring bit is here in the center and there's two stabilizers that, that are, are, uh, have to sit against the rock um, before we can sample. So we, we then core into the rock and as we're coring, the rock, the rock sample goes into a tube. And the tubes look like this, they're about, well, they're um, they're about fifteen centimeters long, give or take, and the core that it gets is six to seven centimeters and one point three centimeters um, in diameter. So that they go, it, it's inside of this the narrower part of the tube here. Um, we have thirty eight tubes that can be used for rock, regolith, or even atmosphere. And then we have what are called witness tubes for contamination knowledge. And I'll, I'll skip over those, but I, if, if anybody has questions, you can ask about them later. And we've used 26 tubes so far. But let me, in the following um, video, I'm going to show you kind of how it works when we go to take to take a sample. Okay, I'm sharing sound. Um, if, if, you, if you can't hear it, it's not a big deal. There's just some sort of mechanical whirring noises. This is an animation that was put together before the mission was launched. So when we decide we're going to collect a sample, we then deploy the arm. We will have already done the abrasion to know what the sample is. We then deploy the arm and put the stabilizers down on the rock. And then you'll see we core into the rock. Um, as we're coring in, the the sample goes into to an already preloaded sample tube, uh, empty sample tube. So you can see the slug of rock in there and the cutaway that is in goes into the tube and then you'll see the tube in yellow here in a second so there's the tube there and so then the tube goes down into the belly of the rover and then another robotic arm grabs the bottom of this tube and takes it over into another um, a sort of a station where we put a, a probe down in to see how much how full the tube is and we image the sample inside the tube as well called the cash cam and then we seal it up put a hermetic seal on the very top and then we move it into storage and we carry on so basically we're back into where the empty tube would have been in the first place It's an incredible system. The technology here, the engineering here is phenomenal. And we've done it 26 times now. But it didn't always, it didn't start off so smoothly. So interestingly, the, this is where we first decided we would we'd take a sample. And from a geological perspective, it seems to be representative of what you see from orbit. These sort of lily pads of sort of multimeter scale um, rock exposures um, with sort of more resistant stuff up on the ridges. But you know, these sort of, these sort of polygons are, are everywhere from orbit and you, what you want is sort of something that's representative. So we decided, okay, we're going to do this. Engineers are like, hey, that's great. Nice and flat. Engineers like flat. And so then they, we, we, we did the abrasion. You can see it just in the, at the edge of the shadow cast by the, uh, by the mast on the ground. You can see the abrasion patch. And then you can see the target next to it, the hole after we we drilled the the sample so with this mission of course nothing is real time because of the the time delay and commands going to and from mars so we upload a whole series of commands to the rover these days as many as three days three martian days worth 
Um, but at this point, we're working day to day and we uploaded the commands for it to, to take the sample. And then we got the data down and it said, yeah, everything went well. Everything went smoothly, start, start to finish. Um, and then we got the cache cam images down a little bit after and they showed that the tube was empty. So this thing is empty, nothing, no rocket in there. And what was really crazy is that this is completely unexpected because this system had been tested um, at NASA JPL in Southern California with as many different types of rocks as they could find in the area 106 times and never had this happened before. In retrospect, it turns out that the rock itself is different from what you have in Southern California. It's sort of a granular weathering um, igneous rock. So think of like where the grains, so, so maybe you can see the grains with your eye, um, like sand grain size um, that would have originally been stuck together during crystallization of that rock during cooling. And then water has percolated in and kind of separated those, those grains from each other. And the whole system is a rotary percussive system. So the whole idea is that it's supposed to uh, prefer the solid sample going into the tube and exclude any of the loose material. And so uh, what's happened is that because of the nature of the rock and how weak it is, it the rotary percussion basically broke it up. And, and the whole sample is right there in the whole sample that was supposed to be in the tube is actually right there in this pile of of tailings at the surface of Mars. So it was excluded from the tube. Um, so with, with that lesson learned, we can still count it as a win because this, these are hermetically sealed. So this, this tube has, has Martian atmosphere in it, which is actually useful if we were to bring that back to Earth. The second sample then we, we kind of, we drove up to a ridge and that's why we chose this one in particular, this sample, this target called Rochette. And then we did the abrasion on it and took the first sample and then we put an extra step in to make sure that it was still there. This is from the mass cam looking at the at the bottom of the, the core um, inside the bit. Uh, so those are the teeth of the bit that you can see the, in this image. And then the cache cam showed, yes, the sample, which we call Mont Denier, is in the tube. And then we sealed it up. And then this is just an image showing that this is was sample, this was tube number 266 in the lab at JPL before it was sent off to Mars. So that that actual tube has the first rock sample, sample ever collected um, from Mars for return to Earth. Uh, the second, we quickly went and did another sample right next to it, and we call this Montagnac for reasons that you'll see here in a few minutes. Um, and then I mentioned, you know, the ingenuity helping us get into the SETA area. This is what it looks like sort of layering, but it, it, interestingly, the layering is not from, from sedimentary processes. These are still igneous rocks of a different type. Okay, and this is called BRAC. You can see this uh, abrasion spot down here in the, the lower right. And this is a detail of the abrasion there on the left of the Durb abrasion. And then you can see the hole that we made when we took the sample um, and and then the, the the sample in the tube, and we took another one shortly after. So then we so we did this a few times on the crater floor, and now we have what we call a suite of samples that are all related to each other, that allow us to say something about um, the we, in context that would allow us to say a lot more if these samples were brought brought back to Earth about the igneous rocks that are and their histories on the the, the crater floor, both in Seta, the older different rocks and ma samples, the younger rocks, lava flows on top. They all have evidence of water percolating through them after they were they were um, emplaced as lava flows. Now, I'm gonna show a few of these sort of images as we go along. And just so you have an idea, if you look at the upper left here, um, each sort of uh, set of images includes the abrasion patch on the left, which is five centimeters across, as I mentioned. And then in the, each of these cases, we took two samples um, and so these are the cash cam images of each sample and the, the, the time at which, the, or the date, the, the sol at which they were collected. And these are 1.3 centimeters across. So this is looking down that tube. And our friend uh, Rubion down here with atmosphere in it <clears throat> and it's, it's abrasion patch. Okay, since then we went around SETA and then we, we entered in, we, we changed campaigns. We, we had the crater floor campaign and then we went to the Delta front. And so the Delta front is finally where we get to the, the area that we, were, we landed here for, the sedimentary rocks that are 
were laid down as the river flowed into the ancient lake that filled up Jezero Crater. <clears throat> and so here you can see the rocks are different, even maybe to the untrained eye. You can see that there's rocks that look that, that are definitely more sedimentary. And um, this gets very exciting because, like I said, this is what we're here for. So we collected several sedimentary rocks as well as a, as a regola sample, a loose sample here at Mo Mountain and Crosswind Lake. Um, and then, uh, and we also collected witness tubes, but I, like I said, I'll come back to that if anybody has questions. So the interesting thing about the Delta front, of course, is that these are sedimentary rocks. And so we, these are some of the areas and some of the targets that we looked at, but this is what it looks like on the ground. And we took samples from up here at Skinner Ridge at the upper right in what's in, 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 in a sort of a unit that we, we call lower rocky top. And you can see it's much more resistant. You can even see layering in it. And then this lighter colored stuff that we're kind of sitting on here, this is called Hogwallow Flats and Wildcat Ridge on the lower left. And these are very different sedimentary rocks. And they're really interesting um, for reasons of, of what sedimentary rocks can tell you, which is namely, which is two things. One is what were the conditions under which the sediments were laid down and turned into rock within the delta itself. And then also, if you have large enough grains that were carried in the river system, you could say something about the rocks that the, those grains came from. And so that for this one, for me, this is really interesting because the most interesting, because the 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 sort of the class that are in this in the in the right hand image as shown in the abrasion patch are on the scale of a few millimeters. And you can do a lot with even a few millimeter size grain about to tell you about what the rocks were like in this huge area that we'll never get to with the rover, this huge area outside of Jezero that was being eroded and carried in. And then the other, and then Wildcat Ridge is really interesting because it has very, very fine grains, very, very small crystals of material. And it's also rich in the sulfate mineral that I mentioned. And so that tells you something about the conditions under which it was either deposited or turned into a rock. Okay, and then um, ultimately though, the reason why we're here is because deltas are habitable environments. And so that's, that's the reason why we're collecting these samples, why we wanna get this, because not only could you have life potentially living in the lake itself, but you could also have had life living in the watershed, the area that was being eroded and transported and then deposited in the delta um, and captured in, in the rocks of the delta itself. Okay, why did we collect two samples of each? Well, in January of last year, we made a backup depot. We, we took uh, all the ones outlined here in green. Um, you can see we we're taking two of each so that we could take one of each of the pair of the same rock and put them down on the surface of Mars um, for, as a backup in case anything happens to our rover in the future. So that's what we did. We, you can see here the plan, they were laid out. Uh, on the upper right, you can see this image taken with, with where everything was um, um, set down by the rover. And all we did was just basically that, that arm on the bottom of the rover would take it out of storage, bring it over to that imaging station, which would grab it and then the arm would move away. And then the imaging station would just let it go and it would drop down to the surface and then we drive on. So there's 10 samples, nine samples in a witness tube that are all laid down on the surface. Uh, you can see them here. And those are, as a, like I said, as a backup in case something happens and we can't get the samples off of our rover in the future. Um, another selfie, job well done. Okay, um, since then we've gone, as I mentioned early on, we've gone up on top of the Delta and now we don't need to take double samples. We just take one of each sample now. And this is showing you somewhere we have taken more than one sample, but it's basically showing you what's on board the rover. And so, um, but since, since this, depot construction, then we've been able to drive up on top of the Delta and in places like Tenby here and then at Emerald Lake and Dream Lake, we've been able to take um, uh, abrasion patch and then take a sample. And they're interesting in their own right, um, you know, Otis Peak, which is the sample from Emerald Lake has even larger um, class or crystals, well, class that are made up of crystals inside of it that are from, again, from the watershed. Um, so these are almost like little, like rocklets, little rocks that, you know, if we get this back on earth, we could, we could study it as it, as its own sample in a sense. So it's almost like having a whole um, jewel box of, of samples within a sample. 
Um, and then we're now we're up on the margin campaign. So we're in this area here um, where uh, uh, at Turquoise Bay, where we started the margin campaign. So the rocks here are different. They have a different character, but they're sedimentary rocks. And so now what we're doing is we're trying to figure out um, more about these. So this is a table in case you're curious about all the, just shows you maybe at a glance what types of samples we have, a number of igneous samples from the crater floor, but mostly sedimentary rocks, some regolith, um, and then everything that's on board, board perseverance is on the left here. And then everything that's at what's called the three forks, the, the depot um, is in the middle. So we, we, ha we have representative samples of, of almost everything. Uh, and we have 17 tubes left, including two that are these witness tubes. And so we are now going to be going on um, and continuing our, our margin campaign. We'll finish that up in the next while. We'll head past where uh, Ingenuity ended up, which is, as you can see there. And we may end up sort of near the L's in Vallis. And then we'll go up on top of through the, the crater rim and then out and beyond. And there we'll get into even older rocks in Neely Planum and we'll deploy those, uh, our, our instruments, and we'll collect our uh, samples and fill up those tubes, and then eventually um, have a sample, a, a phenomenal set of, of sample tubes, um, up to 30 total that can come back to Earth. Um, and I'll, I'll mention that in a minute. Now, we already have 200 rocks from Mars, about 200, um, that are from Mars. Uh, Martian meteorites. That's what I did my my PhD on. But the caveat there is that there's this process of where something has to hit the surface of Mars and blast the rocks off the surface is a very violent one. And and long story short, it only favors young rocks that are are basically the strongest ones that will survive this trip. So they're almost all much much less than three and a half billion years. I.e., they're much younger than the ages that we we are looking at uh, exploring and collecting now. In, including the crater floor. And um, they're probably from Tharsis or Elysium um, because they're igneous rocks. Okay, what's the plan? The plan for Mars sample return is shown in this video here from NASA and ESA. I'll just let it play and then I'll comment. Okay, this is uh, the plans are as a partnership with the European Space Agency um, to send this this lander that you saw with a rocket on board um, that would be where the rover would hand off the the sample tubes and they would slot it into this orbiting sample container and that would then be retrieved by the spacecraft and brought back to Earth. So that is the plan. This image also shows a version of our Ingenuity helicopter with little wheels on it. It also has a little grabber on the bottom. That's an idea, a concept that has been floated for getting those backup samples in case in case something happens to our rover in the next few years, um, where the the ingenuity type helicopter would fly around and pick up those tubes that we put down in that depot at Three Forks, 
How it happens, we'll see. But that's essentially what the plan is. And uh, and as I, I alluded to, there's about 30 seats on the bus to get back to Earth. Um, and if myself and others on the mission do our job right, then we'll have uh, an absolutely phenomenal set of a full 30 tubes that will keep scientists like myself and others busy for for decades. Uh, and that's it. And I will happily take um, questions. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Hurd. That was absolutely mind boggling. Um, I'll start the Q&A. I do invite uh, folks from the audience to come on up and ask the questions. So, Dr. Hurd, uh, when is this Mars return um, rocket supposed to come back to Earth? Do we have an idea? Well, the plan has been 2033 at the earliest um, because, uh, because it takes time to build the, the follow-on missions and then get them there. Um, and then and then get get things back. Um, that'll probably be de almost certainly will be delayed based on um, some um, an independent review board that just uh, delivered its report last September saying that that's un that's unlikely based on on the current sort of um, progress that's been made. So it'd probably be more like 2035. And unfortunately, the you know even the sort of how much to what extent when this happens how. Is up is a bit up in the air, uh, and funding is in the hands of the uh, U.S. Congress, which is never really a, a great place to be. So we'll see. Fingers crossed. Dr. Hurd, I'm wondering what your specific role is um, with this mission. Like, do you, are you one of the ones who pick picks where the sample is taken from? Like, um, how, how involved um, mm. are you? In other words. Thanks. Yeah, I, I kind of I kind of missed on that missed that point, didn't I? Um, I'm a return sample scientist, participating scientist. So, a participating scientist is someone who applies, like I did in in uh, 2018. I applied to NASA to be a member of the mission, not as somebody brought on with the instruments, but in this case, as somebody brought on who has expertise in what you do with samples in the lab, like in my case with meteorites and how you analyze them, curate them, that sort of thing. So there were ten of us selected at that point through the NASA call. I can't get NASA money, so the Canadian Space Agency funds my participation, thankfully. Um, and uh, what we do though, uh, and there were, there were five others that were selected on the European side. And what we do is we join a, a science team that's like 500 strong, but our specific expertise is in the area, like I mentioned, of what to do with the samples in the lab. And and so what we are, are, are yes, we do sort of, we participate in where the samples are going to be collected, but that I will say is a sort of more of a whole team exercise of planning out where we're going to go and then where we might get a sample and kind of bookkeeping that. But the bookkeeping part of, of where we're going, what we sampled and what we need to get at, at, at a high level is our job. And, and actually um, partly my job, in fact, um, I have sort of a leadership role on the team as well as, as I'm one of two representatives of these return sample scientists on the project science group. So the, the sort of science council for the mission along with the leads of the different instruments. Um, but what we are also importantly are the documentarians. So whenever there's a sample that's taken, we produce what's called an initial report. We pull in the data from the different instruments. We write a document, it's sort of a template that we fill out and we, we put in there the initial sort of um, thoughts on the um, results and, and thinking about what type of rocket is and also how it could be used if and when it came back to earth. So so those are our roles of, of yes, it's true, like you were saying, sort of helping to decide where a sample gets collected, but we also document, most importantly, we also document um, everything that we know about the sample at the time of the sampling or with kind of within a month of when it was sampled. Uh, Dr. Hurd, uh, excellent talk. Thank you very much. Um, the I'm wondering whether it's expected that Perseverance will still be functional. Um, uh, clearly, it has to be reasonably functional to get the tubes out. Um, would it be functional enough to continue if you supplied empty tubes? Is there the capability of putting tubes on that return mission? 
Yeah, um, that's a great question. And, and in fact, um, I, I have to give credit to uh, to um, friends, uh, son, a 13 year old who asked that same question when I gave a talk to his class. So you, you're not the first, but I, I think it's a great idea. Personally, it's possible. I don't think it's practical, though. Um, but but yes, in terms of the longevity of the rover, um, this rover is built the way Curiosity is built and Curiosity has been going for, I think, 11 years now. Um, it has a this MMRTG that produces the the the, the power, so it doesn't rely on solar, um, and so it could go for and it is designed to go really for another several years, for a decade total at least. Um, so conceivably, you could, if you were to resupply it with tubes, you could it could keep going and keep sampling. What happens actually, I don't know. Um, we will probably deliver the tubes to a follow-on mission. Um, and then it would have to be decided. Um, all of these missions had go through a process of proposal, leadership writes a proposal to, to do an extended mission. That would probably be the case because you would need money to keep the, the mission going. You know, even without sampling though, I think that the mission could do quite a bit with, let's say it could continue to do abrasions with the abrasion bit and um, with the instruments on board, it could it continue to do quite a, a bit of really important exploration. So we'll see. Um, quick follow up. Um, the we saw how Ingenuity managed to survive for two and a half years with more or less off the shelf computer components and batteries. And I'm wondering whether that has if there's chatter now about um, adding some elements on future missions where they could use the increased CPU horsepower, for instance, uh, for certain instruments that might not last, but they they would um, allow for tech uh, capabilities that you simply can't get with the really slow processors you get with space rated stuff. Mm. I, not that I have heard of, but it's, it's certainly an interesting idea. I'm sure people are thinking about it. I mean, there's, uh, I think you'll see that, you know, now that essentially ingenuity is is wrapping up or is wrapped up, um, you know, the team will be wrapping up it's, and, you know, but the, 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 the sort of the outcomes of that, I think we'll see, we'll see in the near future. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Wonderful talk. Um, a few decades ago, I was lucky to take a course in the solar system from Michael Brown and he spent several sessions on Mars and he gave the comment that if there's going to be evidence of evolution of life, it's probably going to be in the Noachian region, which is higher and more difficult for spacecraft to get to. Uh, my question is, will the rover get to Noachian regions uh, or or will it not get anywhere near Noachian regions? Uh, hopefully it will. In fact, that's what the that's what is outside of the crater. Rim, um, Neely Planum, that area, is the watershed for Neret Vivalis and this um, this delta is Nuwakian. Um, so it is it is one thing that we are really keen to do is to get there, because as old as the rocks appear to be here in the crater itself, um, in the crater rim, uh, we do, we don't have a sense of the actual age of of Jezero Crater. It's probably three and a half billion years, but it, the estimates vary quite widely. Um, again, this relates to the other question about what our role is on the mission. We need to be able to, to choose the right rocks in the crater rim that could allow us to tell what the age of Jezero is. But if you go outside, even just a little ways, this area has been eroded. So you, you have actually, you could actually get under a lot of the sort of the affected area affected by the crater itself. And we see things like mega breccia blocks, gigantic blocks, meter, multiple meters across of jumbled rock that might actually be from the Isidus Basin. And that is, as I mentioned, 3.9 billion years. And those rocks that would be impacted by Isidus are, are older. They're into the Noachian. So we have these tantalizing Noachian rocks not far away at all now. Um, so we're really on the edge of that. And what we're trying to do is to make sure that that we can continue. We hope that you know um, that we'll we'll 
uh, well, the plan is that we will we will get to those rocks in the next year and we'll be able to to sample them and really be into the Noachian. And I agree completely with Michael that that yes, if you're going to see evidence of ancient life, it's probably going to be in the Noachian. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Hurd. Uh, my question is kind of a historical one. Um, we've been on the Martian surface for nearly 50 years with the uh, remote spacecraft. And I wonder if you could sort of put into a kind of a summation of, of the things that we've learned uh, since Viking and Pathfinder and MER and now with the, the two uh, uh, rovers, um, you know, what the surprises have been, what uh, what theories have been confirmed mm -hmm. and uh, thinking that if we're unable to maybe move forward with a sample return in the next uh, decade or two, uh, what you would like to see either on the surface or in orbit around Mars to move forward our research. Thank you. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I think um, I will, I will preface this by saying that I have come into the, the sort of surface of Mars exploration only with this mission. So that's fairly recent for me, although, you know, I am um, a, a keen follower of Mars research. Um, I would say that what I showed you early on, this concept that that the Noachian had more uh, neutral pH water and it went into more acidic, um, that and that that is all part of this uh, global sort of transformation uh, that that occurred geologically that's in the record on Mars. That's one major um, finding and and surprise. It, it comes with being able to co-register where certain minerals, mineral detections are from orbit with the the uh, inferred age of those rocks. Um, the other a uh, couple other things that come to mind, of course, you know, the Vi Viking had the biology experiment that turned out to be surface chemistry. That being said, there are organic molecules on the surface of Mars, and it's been demonstrated by the Curiosity uh, rover, the SAM instrument on Curiosity, that those organic molecules do exist and they probably get oxidized. Um, they, they, sorry, not oxidized. They probably get um, broken down by, uh, by um, um, chlorates, perchlorates uh, in the soil. Um, so that's a major sort of complementary sort of piece of information to the Viking results. Um, it's not to say that Viking, you know, should have found life. Life is, is almost certainly not there at the surface, but the, there's chemistry happening there and there's organic matter and there has been organic matter. That's, that's probably another major finding. Um, and there's, there is water. I mean, certainly that's sort of the joke is that we find water on Mars all the time. Um, but there is water. And, and, and in fact, some of it's even bound up in the soil. That's one thing that struck me when I was reading a sort of review of what curiosity found. There's some component in the, in the soil um, that is sort of um, a non-crystalline amorphous, and it also is hydrous, water-bearing. So there's some interesting things there, I would say. Um, in terms of what's next, it's hard for me, I will say, it's hard for me to think about with without sample return, because sample return has been identified by the scientific community in what's called those dec decadal surveys, the last two, by, as being the next thing that we need in order to really answer some of these questions. Um, that being said, I think uh, that uh, in, uh, in terms of, um, and, and in fact, something that Canada is probably gonna be involved in is an orbiter that has, uh, has um, radar capabilities to be able to look for subsurface ice in more detail than has been done before, um, that sort of thing. Um, but if I had my druthers, I would say, you know what, let's, in the absence of Mars sample return, let's send um, more, maybe send more rovers, maybe send more spirit opportunity type rovers that are less expensive, can be done off the shelf to more places to get us looking at the surface of Mars, getting at the mineralogy, the doing the geology in different places. Um, so we get a better idea, um, basically putting more robotic geologists down on the ground. Any other questions from the audience? Okay, so I have actually two more to wrap it up. Sure. Uh, one of them I'm curious, the Mars storms and the backup plan. So if there is a Mars storm and we've got these tubes on the surface, has, what considerations have been given 
to account for Mars storms or winds, really? Sure. No, it's a great question. And um, we have this concept uh, that that uh, with the global dust storms, that sort of thing, that things could get buried. Things only really get buried in uh, areas where there's active dunes, and there's nothing like that here. Um, and and in fact, we have quite good information from Meta from the from the meteorological um, investigation on the rover about how much dust has been in the atmosphere, the variability through the seasons in this in this area. The amount of dust that would that is would accumulate on those tubes in 10, 20 years would be would be almost almost nothing. Um, so there's no and and we didn't put them down in in any dunes. So this it's not an active area of of sediment transport. So there's no uh, danger of them getting covered up or anything like that. Even with a global dust storm type thing, um, I think we get this picture from the opening scene from The Martian. Is what I think. <laughs> it's not like that. Oh, very good. No, that's that's. I was very curious about that. And the last question, a personal one. Do you have any meteorites personally that you found? Um, and do you have Did one? I... To show if you have one. I'm not oh, sure. Oh, I, I don't. I, I don't have any in my uh, in my office. I don't keep them here. <laughs> I keep them in the in the vault. Um, I I have found some meteorites at a place called White Court. It's northwest of Edmonton. There's a crater that's in the woods south of White Court that formed about 1100 years ago that I investigated with colleagues a few years ago. Um, and that's the first time I'd ever collected meteorites from the field. And in that case, they're metallic. You go with a metal detector, you can dig them up. So I collected a bunch of those. Um, actually, some of that was on TV. There was a, a show called The Meteorite Man that came out and filmed that. Um, uh, otherwise, uh, yeah, I, I don't, I only have a couple of meteorites personally um, partly because um, I have lots of I have lots of rock samples. I have other samples that I've collected over the years and have been have bought or have been given or what have you. Um, but only a couple of meteorites. Um, probably because I'm around them all the time. I don't feel the need to have a, a personal collection so much. Very good. So thank you so much, Dr. Hurt, for calling us and spending some time um, with us from Alberta. I hope it's not too cold out there. With that, thank you so much. Really appreciate your time today. You're welcome. Thank you. Take care.